Well, I'm trying to like just kind of ease <laughs> us into the conversation, <laughs> but we do usually at least say welcome to the Dauntless Podcast. This is episode 18. I'm here is with... Is it? No. Oh my God. Why? He's like, wasn't it on episode 10? Like three episodes ago? It's not. It's not episode 18. Start over. See? (laughs) It's episode 13. Lucky number 13. And we've we've managed to get Meg, Coach Meg, on the podcast. She just waved for those of you listening. Yeah, she she just waved. We're going to warm Meg up a little bit to being on the podcast. And Jackie, who has been on the podcast before, but One I think time. we'll talk a little bit more about Jackie, because last time we talked about, I think, everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I think I talked about myself once. Yeah. So, Jackie, do you have any advice for Meg after having been on the podcast? Uh, it gets easier as you continue talking. The, the conversation starts to feel more natural. Okay. <laughs> we'll wait for what, that. What, what, is, what is it that's making you so nervous to, to be on the podcast? Just that, put it out there for everybody to know so that we can just squash it. That I will say something too personal and immediately want to retract the statement. Well, what would be the worst that happens if you said something that was too personal? I don't know. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for all the millions of viewers we have. that are listening, it's yeah. like, say, hi, Billy. Hi, yeah. Julie. <laughs> like, if you're willing to say it, like, in front of the class, like, it's fine. It's all good. It's all good. All right. Those are our listeners. Cool. So, all ten of them. I wanted to, um, I think what we're going to focus on today is just trying to get to know some more people at the gym through the podcast. So just getting to know you ladies a little bit more. I know a lot about how you guys came to CrossFit. More about Meg. I don't even know if I really know about how you came to CrossFit, Jackie. So that'll be interesting. And then we also want to talk about more nutrition topics the CrossFit Open is coming up, and I'll just put it out there. We have a nutrition challenge that we are going to do over the course of the Open. So we want to talk a little bit about performance nutrition and hopefully encourage some of you guys to join the challenge and focus on your nutrition through the Open. Yes, so please do. It'll be really fun. Yes. Don't make me do it alone. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Jackie, let's have you start so that Meg can just... <laughs> And you can comment, you can ask her okay. questions, you know, about what Don't worry, is going we're having on. a conversation. <laughs> yes. So, Jackie, tell us how you found CrossFit and when it kind of clicked for you that you were going to stick with it. You really sure, liked it. Sure, that's a great question. Thank Jan. you so much. <laughs> uh, so, I actually did my very first CrossFit class ever in 2014, but I didn't actually start doing CrossFit I, and then I didn't do it again until 2016 when I moved to New Hampshire. I was actually okay. in grad school when I tried it for the first time. My advisor, um, she is like this amazing, amazing sports dietitian, just an amazing athlete. At I think she turned 50 when I was in grad school. And she was still actively like a competitive rower. She played like intra- various intramural sports like ice hockey and field hockey. And mm-hmm. she also, as her regular form of exercise, did CrossFit five days a week. Oh, my god! And I was like... This lady's crazy. <laughs> so you were already in school to be a dietitian. Correct. Okay. Yes. And so I was one of her um, graduate assistants. I worked in her sports nutrition lab. And towards graduation, she invited myself and two of my friends who were also her graduate assistants out to where she lived in the suburbs. She's like, let's spend the day together. I want to take you guys out to lunch. We'll do like a CrossFit class. I mean, she had this whole day plan for us. Cool. And so that was the first time I tried CrossFit. And I, like, don't really remember what the workout was. There was, like, not a barbell in sight. It was, like, this weird team workout, whatever. We did, like, kettlebell swings and ab mat setups and rowing. And I was, like, I love this. Cool. <laughs> um, and it was just super, super fun. And I just remember there being a lot of camaraderie in class. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I kind of didn't really come back to it until we moved to New Hampshire. And I was, like, I want a way to do regular exercise. But also I need to make friends because I'm brand new here. And I feel really sad and lonely and I want to meet some people too. So that's nice you got that taste or else you might not have known that was right, the type of right. place and to Right, right. And also because, you know, being with my professor and we had done like various testing um, when I worked with her, like we measured resting metabolic rate, we measured um, VO2 max, like your max aerobic capacity. And so we had like athletes from her gym, like different CrossFit oh, athletes, as okay. well as herself coming in and doing all this testing. And I'm like seeing their results. I'm like, wow, there's really something to this CrossFit thing. <laughs> They're super fit. Yeah. And also just like we, I looked at her DEXA scan. So seeing her bone density and her body composition. And it was like, 
like literally they're like this is average for a 50 year old and like this is where she is like way above off the charts because she's been doing like weightlifting for you know mm. several decades mm. i'm like i gotta get i gotta get in on some of this so anyway yeah. i started crossfit just met so many so many amazing people i mean and i was like hooked from the very very beginning and you when you started that was at black pearl mm-hmm. yeah, yeah in nice. hampton nice um, that was in April 2016, so I, like, just missed the start of the Open, which was probably a good thing for me because that might have been, like, really uh, discouraging. Yeah, my second um, week of ever me. doing CrossFit, I did Murph, so. Yeah, that was so you good. know what that feels like. <laughs> and you're like, these people are crazy. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny, so basically from then, I just, I found CrossFit, and it was just really cool to see, especially, I mean, you know, men do amazing things in CrossFit, but obviously I'm more connected with what women are doing. Yeah. Yeah. And just seeing what women could do, seeing moms in there with their kids, seeing women who are pregnant still like out there every day. It it just gave me this whole new sense of like what my life could continue to be and how I can continue to grow as an athlete. Cause I grew up as an active person, you know, played various sports. And then I was like, Oh, this is something I could really continue to progress in. And I'm just so competitive by nature that it gave me a competitive outlet without, you know, needing to be like on a sports team or something like that. Yeah. So in the years leading up to when you went with um, your professor to her CrossFit class, were you just like working out in a gym or did you play any sports in school, intramurals maybe? Uh, In college, I didn't really, I would like try going to the gym a little bit here and there, like run, nothing really stuck when I was in college. I was too busy like partying and stuff. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, And then after... (laughs) I was. That's okay. I think uh, I, I just can't I, imagine it. I, 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 went was to like, too, yeah. I went to Penn State, which the is like a is... huge party school, a huge state school. Like, yeah. It was a lot of fun. The, the crazy thing is that I guarantee that both of you partied harder in college than I did. I'm, yeah. I'm I can guarantee it. Mean, I don't know what you did, but I can guarantee I did. I was, I'm I was not. I'm absolutely sure. I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't drink my freshman year, my sophomore year, and most of my junior year. Yeah. Freshman year because I was afraid of getting in trouble. Sophomore year because I was an RA and I had a lot to lose. And junior year because I was like counting every single calorie that went into my body. And also my roommates were all 21. So they would just drink at the apartment and then be like, okay, we're going to the bars. Bye. It's like, okay, I'll sit here by myself buzzed. (laughs) So, yeah. All right, yeah, so you were busy anyway. partying. And then um, after I finished college, I started doing a lot of yoga. So that was like my regular exercise. Okay, so nice. I was like a five-day-a-week yoga person. Um, actually, when I was in grad school, I started teaching yoga. But then once I found CrossFit, I was kind of like, I'm good. You're good. And that's so interesting to think that like you weren't coming from Olympic lifting or, you know, any sort of like, I don't know, sport where some of the – the training might be similar to CrossFit because having met you only in, I think, early 2017. It, 2018. 2018. Okay. I mean, you you look to me like you are a CrossFit professional. No, I mean, I played sports growing up. Like, I played softball most of my life and I ran yeah. track in high school. So I think you have um, some, you of, have that some of that. And I did like some weightlifting when I was in, like, I had some exposure to it in middle school and high school. So it wasn't like, oh, cool. I wasn't scared of lifting a barbell or like, becoming strong or something like that. Although I do remember going in for an intro being like, I don't want to get bulky. And now I'm like, wah, wah. <laughs> well, First of all, like, that's really hard to do. And yeah, second yeah, of yeah. all, I'm like, I wouldn't, first of all, I don't care now. And I'm like, I like my muscles and I like yeah, being yeah. strong and whatever my body looks like because of my strength is just what it is. And I'm happy with that. Yeah, I've gone completely the opposite direction. Like if I walked in and multiple men were like, that girl could kick my ass, I would be thrilled. I'm like, yes. <laughs> can (laughs) yes i can yes okay meg i'm up you're up okay so tell us how you found crossfit and what about it or when it kind of clicked for you that it was going to be your sport um i found crossfit because i was looking for something for phil to do actually who he was my at the time boyfriend now husband so he played sports all through high school college and when we graduated kind of wanting to stay active became really hard because he was so used to, like, that team yeah. and, like, working out with people. But uh, if you've ever looked into, like, playing sports after you graduate college, it's, like, all the intramules or, like, 
adult fourth leagues happen after work and usually like really late at night. Like yeah. some games are like, oh, it's like show up at 10 o'clock. And, you're and like, you have oh. to have a whole team or yeah. get put on randomly with people you don't know. And yeah. so, it's not consistent. Either. Right. So that was just like not going to be a possibility. So I was actually on Facebook and I saw this kid that I went to high school with posting pictures and videos. And it was a very basic building that had like no, no like mirrors, like nothing in it. Mm-hmm. And they're like thrown down like I see like kettlebells they've got barbells and I'm like what is this because he's like working out with other people but like not with other people yeah yeah so I was like this is like really weird because it's not like aerobics like what you traditionally think of as like a workout class where you're like all following the same Mm -hmm. routine and along with the instructor it's like clearly they were doing the same workout but like at their own pace yeah 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 um so I messaged him and I'm like what is this like what are you doing he's like oh it's crossfit So we just basically looked for CrossFit around us and saw that it was very expensive at the time for us, especially coming out of college. It was like, whoa. So we waited a little bit of time and then Phil's friend actually was got into CrossFit. So this is in now 2013 uh, that we eventually started, but he took him to a competition and Phil, I was at work and Phil went to the competition and, and saw these people working out oh, and, and competition energy is like oh yeah unmatched and Phil's very competitive and he was like oh you know like I'm doing this thing these people are doing this thing and Phil's like I don't know if I can do this thing oh like and I don't now know, you know and Phil. Like, yeah so he was like <laughs> he's like I should like I feel like I should be able to do it. like I could have done this before like it's like I want that so like that was kind of like the kick in the pants of like it doesn't matter how much it costs like we're just gonna go to a class and try it yeah we're yeah just gonna give try it go. Out. yeah um So we went to Ever Proven CrossFit in Dover. That's where we started. And we did our intro class together. So this is in August of 2013. And we tried to sign up before we did the intro class. Like before we even tried it, we're like, we want a membership. (laughs) And the coach that was there was like, you need to like try try it first. Like just like, let's make sure this is like really what you want to do. And we're like, no, no, we know. So we did the intro class and then we immediately signed up after that yeah um so I didn't realize how exciting it was going to be for me like I really was just like doing this to do it with him in support of Phil I didn't even really know like how long I was going to do it for but like from literally the intro I was like yes well you (laughs) just because I know this you leading up to try and CrossFit were already on a let's just say like health related journey right yes yep So do you think that had something to do with your wanting to dive right in? Um, I guess a little piece of it, like I was like, had been what you're talking about. I'm sure we'll get more into it later when we talk more about the nutrition stuff. But like my journey at the time of like getting towards a healthier place was mostly centered around what I was eating. So my nutrition habits. Um, So, and I'd been going to like uh, Wildcat Fitness. I don't know if it exists anymore, but it was like. Kind of like a Planet Fitness or whatever, but like on a small version of that in Durham on oh, my yeah, own. Yeah. yeah, I know that place. Yeah. Yeah. But see, like kind of running on the treadmill, like doing some random stuff. I don't really know what I was doing. Putzing around. Yeah, yeah. just like whatever. So We've all sat in elliptical for yeah. 45 minutes, okay? So I was, <laughs> I liked the fact that it was structured and someone was telling me what to do. Like, yeah, that was great. So I didn't have to like figure it out. And then... Two things, kind of similar to what Jackie said when I was there. I saw women doing things that I never imagined women could do. Mm. So that was, like, very interesting to me of, like, yeah. oh, I could, like, I could do pull-ups without right. assistance. Like, I, that could be me. So, like, that was very motivating. Yeah. And then the third thing was in my intro, they would ask you to do something, and I didn't have a lot of athletic experience prior to CrossFit. So everything was very new to me, and I was kind of, like, I don't want to, I had some reservations of not wanting to do some things or not knowing if I could do things. Mm. And they said right away in the intro, oh, you can't, you don't feel comfortable or you can't do that. Try this. So important. And so he scaled for me. And when I couldn't do what the scaled was, he said, oh, that's okay. Do this. So it was like, there was like an infinite number of ways of doing all the movements. And I was going to find my own success in doing some version of it yeah to the point where 
Phil and I did the intro workout side by side, racing against each other because we're competitive against each other, but doing two different versions of the workout. Yeah. And it was like equally exciting and motivating for both of us, even though we were lifting different weights, jumping on different boxes, doing slightly different movements. Uh, it, that was really cool. I never found that before. It was, you know, growing up, if you can't do this and you're in a large group of kids, you kind of just get left to the side. So I really was encouraged that everyone could participate yeah. in some version of the workout. Yeah, I... And I'd never seen that before. That's that's a good shout because I will give <clears throat> Ever Proven and their approach to the programming that I've seen anyway a definite, definite shout out because when I started here, we were part of Ever Proven and we were getting their... Um, the same programming mm-hmm. that I think you were doing at the time. Uh, probably when you started, it wasn't me. At some point, it switched to, okay. me, to me programming. But, but there yeah. was this whole concept of like, there was the RX, the prescribed mm-hmm. set. And then there was also like defined scaling options within. And I had gone to two CrossFit gyms previously. The first one that really didn't offer that. Like I would say it was like maybe a bit more old school CrossFit or something like when I couldn't do a pull up, I was just sort of like, well, just keep trying and then mm-hmm, walk mm-hmm. away like coach walks away. And it's like, maybe I could have done it. And they knew that. And we're just trying to get me to get it. But as a brand new person, like you need to have something you know, you can do before you start figuring out how to like, apply intensity to that or, or really focus on the things that you can't do. Or self-regulate, think, kind of. Right. You really exactly. need that guidance. Because yeah, I remember specifically doing something with um, dips. And Ooh. she had like the t- like the two dip um, bar things like that you can, outdoor. yeah, yes. yeah. And so she had me on those, and she- it was like for the longest time, I-, I didn't know what to do with them. So I'm just trying to do dips, and I can like go down like three inches. And it wasn't until like the end of the workout that the coach was like, oh, like if you put your feet on the back, maybe that would help you like just like adjust the weight a little bit to your what you can actually do. And it was like. Well, I wish I had known that before because I actually would have gotten full range of motion and done mm-hmm. everything. So when I came to Ever Proven in the first workout I did, there was, you know, something that I could just go, oh, well, let me try that. Like, I'm definitely not advanced. <laughs> let me just go right down to intermediate and beginner and mm-hmm. see what's what's on, going on over there. So I, I definitely appreciated that about the programming, like the actual highlight on scaling. Cause yeah. It's an important part of CrossFit, but I don't know that all gyms – focus on it as much as people need. Yeah, so. there can definitely be a lot of emphasis on like RXing the workout and like yeah. doing that at whatever cost. Right, right. But really, I feel like here that you guys do such a good job of just being like highlighting what the um, intent of the workout mm. is and the intensity you should be yeah. working at and finding whatever weight, whatever movement, whatever scaling option is going to help you achieve that intensity. And then everybody, like Mike said, is doing the same workout even if we're doing slightly different movements, different weights, whatever, we're all still doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And you have, we have so many like seasoned veterans here too that are like, I think it's probably nice for a new person to come in and watch, you know, me with my feet up on a box doing uh, handstand push ups, f- not on the wall. You know what I yeah. mean? It's, it's, all, a lot of pe- the members at our gym really scale a lot. So, you know, to their own personal needs. So I like that a lot. So that really resonated with you. And from there on, is that what inspired you to start coaching? Or was there a specific event that made you go, oh, I should coach? Um, I tried to play some sports growing up and it didn't go well. <laughs> so like, you know, when you start like a sport, typically like your freshman year of high school, it's like everybody gets to participate, right? Because it's like they just want you to like yeah. come try it. Yeah. So like I did that. Everybody participates in like track and volleyball. Um, and then when people started to like improve and they learned the sport, like I didn't Mm -hmm. improve. Um, I think I learn sport differently than some people do. Like I need a little bit more breakdown of steps, uh, like how to perform something. I can't just watch somebody do it and Mm -hmm. copy it. Like that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, so again, a big group of people when you can't do something, no fault of necessarily my coaches then, but it's like you need to focus on the people that are continuing to move on. Like when you have so many people participating. Right, right. Especially as it gets like later in certain high schools, it's like, well, you're just like not on the team anymore. Right. So that's what happened. So I was like 
playing and I loved being on the team with everyone. I loved coming to practice. I didn't really play in the games. That really wasn't a big deal to me. Like I really didn't yeah. care that I wasn't playing in the games. Like I just loved playing the sports that I was playing and getting to have like be on a team and like all the aspects that go along with it. Right. So it when I got cut from those teams my sophomore year because oh, they had legitimate Oh yeah, they were like, yeah, you can't like you're not playing anymore like you didn't Bummer. make it. And I was like really upset. I'm like, well, now I've like bonded with these people. Like something I really yeah, enjoy. I like is like my after school activity. Like what am I supposed to do? So it was kind of like I like the sky was the limit in my mind and oh, they okay. were telling me no. Oh, you're done. Like, I oh, see. you're done. And it wasn't like I decided I was done. They were just like, well, you can't figure this out. So, like, you're done. Yeah. So, like, that was, like, always in me. And when I came to CrossFit, it was like, there's literally no no. Like, right. no one is going to tell you you can't do something. And that, like, blew me away. Yeah, And, yeah. like, that was the moment I was like, I want to be a part of this. And I want to, like, make the integral in that it, change yeah. for other people. Like, I'm – you can see, I'm like, it really makes me emotional, like, yeah. to give, to be in a position to give that gift to other people who may have felt that, not even through sport, but in just various ways of their life of yeah. someone telling them they weren't good enough or no, um, that they can come here and feel, feel that. Yeah. <laughs> see, it's a big this deal. Why is the best. Right. I mean, I've noticed it the day, the day that I was first ever coached by Meg. Well, I should say we did the Wad and Wine, which if you listened to last episode, you got a description of what the Wad and Wine was at, at this gym years ago. But so I met Meg very briefly there. But when Meg first came to the gym and I was, it wasn't the summer class because there was like, she came for her first summer class and there was like, 30 people in class when she was promised there was going to be like eight people in class or less <laughs> but it was like the first class that we were inside i remember we were up here and you were just going through like scaling options mm -hmm. like you were just describing the workout and going through scaling options and in my head i was like this woman is doing what she was put on this earth to be doing <laughs> like no doubt about it so that people are very lucky to be coached by somebody Aww. who cares about them that much for real thanks and i i happen to be coached by both of you guys <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I am who i am i was actually talking to michael about that um you know like you are the five people you spend the most time with or whatever and i spend a lot of time with you gals so <laughs> and that's a that's a that's a choice <laughs> so we're all really awesome is yeah what's, we're, what's all, we're all awesome world best yes okay so that I I can understand why you would want to just dive right into yeah, I was that. Yeah, fired up about it. There is no end stage, and I really liked your comparison too at the at the beginning of your story to like group fit, other group fitness classes where it's like a boot camp style or it's like Zumba or whatever. Where even though like it may not be the most intense thing, you are required to to follow along at the same pace, rate, and ability of everybody else, and to have that, like, that that's a good way of explaining scalability. Like, mm -hmm. you're doing the same workout, you're doing it together, but you're doing it for yourself and at your own pace. Because yeah. yeah. if you bring me into, like, Zumba, it's like, oh, no. Oh, I can't go in Like, there. I'm, like, terrified. I'm, like, I, I have to, like, like move at the bit. same places, same pace, and, like, I get lost in what's going on. Like, it's – that seems much more challenging for me personally. Yeah, I even get a little bit um, finicky with that in the um, yoga classes. Like, it's – we used to go across the street um, before COVID and do a lot of um, yoga, a, a group of us on Thursdays. And I did yoga at the former like power yoga place in Exeter years ago. And I remember always being like, oh, like I got to follow along. I got to stay with them. Like my leg isn't as high as everybody else's. Like you just, because everybody's literally doing the same exact thing. But then after doing CrossFit, going over there, it's, it's almost... CrossFit has made even that better because I'll, I'll go like I'll listen to the instructor when she says if you just need to take a rest take a rest do that because CrossFit has instilled this like better sense of self mm -hmm. and so I can do that and not feel like I'm doing better or worse whatever than the people next to me it's just like I just need to take a second and go down to child's pose and then I'll meet you in warrior in a minute <laughs> so I get that okay so 
let's talk a little bit about how nutrition overlays on this because I think both of you have like a long history of thinking about your nutrition. So I'm very I'm very interested in when that when that started. Hmm. Let's let's start with Jackie because I think you've got a long history of it. You went to school for it, so it must have I started did. early. I did. Well, so I, I think my first connection with nutrition, and I, I didn't like lead my whole life thinking like, I'm going to be a dietitian. Like it really didn't dawn on me until like I was basically done with college. Mm. Um, but I've always had a, a strong relationship. So what did you go to college for? Uh, I actually, st- I started as pre-med and then, because oh. I, I knew I just wanted to help people in some way in the healthcare system. And I really didn't know how. I, I actually was an EMT when I was a senior in high school and I did that oh, cool college. And so you'd kind of see... I just knew I wanted to help people. Yeah. Let's leave it there. And then um, kind of as I progressed through college, I wasn't necessarily, I mentioned I went to a party school um, and I enjoyed that very much. And I wasn't, I wasn't achieving the grades that you need to go to medical school. And so that was a little bit shattering for me. Um, But in retrospect, I'm glad that ended up being what it was. Mm. Um, So I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I just knew it was going to be something in like the health field. And so I just continued to take, courses for like all my basic sciences and whatever I'm like I'll figure it out after I'll have to just go to like another school so I'm like am I gonna do PT am I gonna do like athletic training am I gonna do you know I had like all these like various things I'm like maybe I'll do something else so anyway I took all those prereqs um but I always had a good relationship with food um just in terms of like like my family like we just enjoy eating eating um so that what I (laughs) I would say is my my first love and I was very fortunate to grow up in a house where my mom like cooked dinner most nights and we sat down and we ate dinner when possible. You know, as you get older, that gets harder because yeah. all three mm-hmm. of us kids played sports. And so you get very busy, but that was just like a very normal thing. So as I progressed through college and you have like your own apartments and your own kitchens, you start, you know, just dabbling with cooking a little bit more. And so you start leaning on some of those like childhood recipes. Like I'd make my mom's chicken soup and she made us like, chicken teriyaki and then I started like putting my own like spin on things and so I always made not necessarily like super healthy things but I was just getting myself more acclimated to like healthier cooking and what what that meant for me and then and it's a wake-up call to when you get out of college or you first start cooking for yourself like I remember being like I have to do this all the time because you go from your you know, I would get food from my stepmom growing up. Like that was where we got most of our meals and she was similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you go to college and you eat at a dining hall. Right. I just remember being like, holy smokes, this is going to be my whole life. Cereal. I know. <laughs> I know. And when left we had a lot of chop suey. <laughs> a lot of chop suey. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it wasn't. So anyway, I figured out I wanted to do nutrition. And then, you know, I went to graduate school for all that. And honestly, actually, the worst eating time of my life was probably while I was in graduate school because I had very little time. I ate a lot of Wawa hoagies, which so was like, learning about nutrition, nutrition, but had very little time yeah. for it. Okay. Um, but it really wasn't until I moved to New Hampshire that I really started like figuring out like really good nutrition for myself. And part of that is because I then started gardening when we moved here in 2016. And so when you have a bounty of vegetables, you have no choice but to eat them. Yeah. Um, And that really helped me between that and then, you know, once I became pregnant with my older daughter, um, that was really when I, like, hit my, like, healthiest strides because you're, like, suddenly you're, like, oh, my God, like, what I'm putting into my body is literally what's going to become my child. And so you become much, much, much more cognizant of, um, you know, how all those things kind of are going to affect you. And then I'm like, oh, my God, I, like, feel amazing. It's like, because I'm, like, eating really well and not drinking. And yeah. Staying hydrated and I'm very active. I'm like, this is, this is what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so after that, and, you know, you go through waves with any sort of thing, you know, if I'm traveling or whatever, you know, tend to fall off a little bit or, like, over the holidays. But the more, I, I find for myself, the more consistent I can be when you have those moments. Like, my husband and I look at each other and we're like, we have to eat vegetables today because we have been eating out a lot and like this feels Mm -hmm. awful like we're just dragging through the day like down in coffee because that's the only way to like keep yourself functioning basically and so just starting to make those connections a little bit more of like what I'm putting into my body 
can make me feel good or it can make me feel bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it gets a little bit easier every day. Yeah. So it's been pretty present in your life for a long time. Would you say that the, like, d- does any of your childhood like eating habits or things that you learned from your family impact the way that you eat today or is it pretty informed by your education now? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think more of like the way I grew up eating impacts more like how I present food to my own children Yeah. because I, I know I have a healthy relationship with food in, in some sense. Um, and so I'm trying my best to kind of impart that for them too because raising two young girls and certainly like in the back of my mind, like I know how much of an impact the family dynamic around food can impact a young yeah. boy or girl. Yeah. Um, but so a lot, but then what I do now is, is more driven by my education and then, and my own experiences too. And honestly, just being here and being around other people like Meg who are super motivated, super yeah. dialed in and consistent um, and having been, you know, the nutrition coach here since 2018, you know, I know that I need to be practicing what I preach to. And so it's motivating for me all the time and helps keep me accountable that being in this position, like, I got to do it too. I got to live it. I got to walk the walk. Yeah. Um, it's not perfect every day, but it's something that I always am kind of returning back to. And, and I, I try to think of it as like, you're always trying to like raise what your baseline is. Like, even when kind of like the wheels are falling off, like how how well can I still be doing? How balanced can I be? What am I making a priority? Even when I don't feel like I have like the mental capacity to be like making healthy meals. Like what's yeah. happening? Like the core decisions, the default decisions. Right. Or just after better. like the holidays, or whatever, because I had like a long um, stretch of like not eating particularly well after Christmas because our fridge was like jammed full of leftovers. Um, and there was, like, not a ton of protein in there. And so actually for, like, mm-hmm. a week after Christmas, I was, like, eating all these meals that were very low protein. I was, like, eating, like, mostly a vegetarian diet because I just – that was what was in the fridge, and I do yeah. not waste food. <laughs> yeah, so there's a prioritization you have, right? Right. Eat, what, right. eat what's in the fridge and then – Right. But then finally I got to a point I'm like, oh, my God, I cannot wait for all this food to be gone because I need to, like, refocus – and I mean, I felt it like my energy levels were so, so, so low. Yeah. I'm like, this is not just because of like sleep and children and whatever, or like, you know, working out really hard. This is because my nutrition is not going so well. It's not sufficient. Um, I remember we were here and you were like, I need something besides pasta. <laughs> like, you're like, today's carbs the day. And yeah. like, is... I can't eat any more versions of carbs and cheese together, as much as I love them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. Well, and I think when you, I, I've, I've experienced a little bit, but I have to imagine when you do eat nutritionally well-rounded, and that's mostly your baseline, you notice coming out of that faster than average, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. I know that's true for you too. Yeah. 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 You get like the, when you don't have a lot of sugar and you have something with sugar and you're like, eyes hurt. And yes. your teeth hurt. You're like, what? I never <laughs> felt this before. Yeah, right. the, the instant headache yeah. actually happened to me yesterday. We we're at like a child's birthday party, and I had like half a dessert thing. I was like, I feel sick. Yeah, so sick. Yeah, yeah. That, it was that, delicious, that, and I felt sick. That that I I haven't experienced that with sugar because I have a healthy dose of sugar in my life. So I I the teeth I just live with the teeth pain, I guess. But the. Uh, <laughs> I noticed that when um, Michael and I quit drinking, which I've talked about on the podcast, and I, like, it's not, like, some, like, stake in the ground for me. Like, if somebody, like, if we go to Italy next year, I'll, I'll have a glass of Italian wine. Like, I will do that. Mm-hmm. But I had a glass of wine or champagne or something um, at some point, and I think I had, like, three sips, and instantly I was like, no, like, I could, like feel the tannins in my eyes or whatever (laughs) so I get that I get that for that anyway okay I do have a question about like the like positioning it for your kids Mm -hmm. and where where you go with that so do you have any certain like 
strategies or like mentality that you apply on that or a mantra that you that you try to think about to make sure you're communicating nutrition to Mara in a mm-hmm. way that you think is going to be successful. I'm just I've thought about that so much cuz one of those things yeah, it's my childhood messages have carried with me. Mm-hmm. Like finish what's on your plate. Those types of things that I've they've carried with me into my adult approach to eating. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. There I have a, a couple different ways that I present it and it's, you know, this constant evolving thing um you know, raising children and, and dealing with food. One of them is just like, I decide what's for dinner and she gets to decide how much and what she eats from what's available. Okay. So I don't, I always make sure there's at least one thing that I'm serving that I, I'm pretty confident she's going to eat one of her like safe foods or, or whatever. Sometimes that's cauliflower. Sometimes it's a quesadilla. Sometimes safe it's Safe food meaning pasta. like things you know she's pretty much always going to yeah. gonna eat. Okay. Foods that she'll, she'll pretty much always eat. And sometimes she doesn't want those things. Sometimes all she does is eat cucumbers. I'm like, whatever, that's fine. But I get to decide what's for dinner. She doesn't get to make, you know, demands once we're like at the table, like, no, but I wanted this. And I'm like, I'm not going to get up and go fix her something else. Like, and she, I always try to make the kids some version of what I'm having. It doesn't always work out that way because of like, you know, she doesn't want to eat anything spicy or, you know, You're too up mixed up. You don't whatever. want things yeah. to be touching each other, whatever. And so, okay. like, like I might make tacos and she has, like, the deconstructed version of the taco okay. or whatever. Like, she gets all the pieces on her plate. They're not mm-hmm. touching each other. Whatever. I- I'm willing to do that. And if all she wants to do is, like, eat more of something, like, that's totally fine, too. Like, I'll go get more of whatever's already on the table. Okay. And I and I do try to include her in the meal planning process, mm-hmm. which starts for me at the grocery store. I say, do you want to pick out one or two vegetables that we can have for dinner this week? She's like, yes. And she like goes and like picks out a couple things. And then when I'm, when I'm putting dinner together, I say, Mara, what vegetable would you like to have with dinner? Uh, and then she'll pick it. And sometimes she eats it. Sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she helps me chop things. And she like eats it while she's helping me cut things and then won't eat it at the table whatever it is, that's totally fine. Um, and then more recently, um, she helped me decide what goes in her lunchbox. And so we've started talking about making sure that she has balance in her lunch. Mm-hmm. And so I just say like, we need to pick a vegetable, uh, a fruit, um, a protein, and then like, you know, something, something else. I forget how I phrase it. Like I usually put like a crunchy thing, like a cracker, or a goldfish, yeah. or, you know, Bombas. something else. Bombas. I know. I need to go to Trader Joe's <laughs> to get some of those. Well, and then I, sometimes I, like a little square of dark chocolate, um, yeah. which she oh, gets nice. super excited about. She always tells me that she eats it first, <laughs> which is fine. I don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so recently we've been talking about like, she's like, mom, I need a protein. I'm like, yes, you're right. Ooh, what's that going to be? And so I, I need to do a little better at making sure that I have those things. The right things. So that when she's asking. Well, it was, it was interesting to experience a little bit of that, see that conversation the other day. Jackie and I were having our... Uh, weekly nutrition meeting and Mara was in here with us and we were talking about my goals and one of my goals being to get more lean protein and Jackie was like you know see Mara like other people need to get protein too (laughs) and she was just like looking at me and I was like yeah we have the same goals (laughs) (laughs) so that was cute for her to just kind of like realize that and then she was going through her lunchbox and um, it looked like she had eaten a good amount of her chicken. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're doing better than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, it's one of those things I've thought about a lot, especially because, and we've talked about this, like, you know, I, I have plenty of women in my life who would be in my kids' lives that have a very, um, food is good and bad, you know, mm-hmm. those sorts of beliefs that have affected me in my life. So I've thought a, a lot about how you broach that. Yeah. And I think a lot too has to do with like, um, just behavior at mealtimes, I think is a big part of it. And yeah, like, I try doing? to just like, you put the food down and then like, let's talk about something else. Like there's no like, try another bite, mm-hmm. two more mm-hmm. bites, That's and then you can have you. dessert. Like take all the pressure off. Like imagine as an adult, someone puts, the waiter comes and puts the food down in front of you. And then you try a bite of something. Like, Did you have a bite of that yet? Did, did you take a bite yet? Oh, you like that? Oh, do you want some more? Like, and just like constantly on yeah. top of you and badgering you about your meal. Like you're not going to enjoy that meal very much. 
right, and right, you're going right. to kind of like, you'll have some sort of pushback in some way to someone like just harping on you about how you're doing and how your meal is going. And so right. you have like to you like, put it down you have to like, let, don't eat the chocolate where she's like, I want to eat the chocolate first. Right. It's you like know? that. And that just goes with the same mentality of like, I decide what's on the table. I've decided this is like the meal we're having today. She can choose what to eat. And like, you have to give them that control. So what if she has, I'm sure this has happened where she just doesn't want to eat. And I say, okay, if it's dinner time, I say, this is the last food of the day. There's nothing after this. Mm-hmm. She's like, okay. And then if later at, in bed, she's like, I'm feeling a little hungry. I say, okay, we'll eat at breakfast tomorrow. Like I, and because I don't want to get into the habit of like, oh, hold on, let's put off bedtime for 10 more minutes. Mm-hmm. So you can go eat some yogurt or whatever. And it doesn't happen it happens like so infrequently now because she knows well, because she, she knows, knows when that. I say like yeah. last food of the day, like you mean that's it. it. Kitchen's closed. And also kids, I think, are much more in tune with like their hunger and satiety cues. So sometimes she yeah. eats like two bites at breakfast, gigantic lunch, like some snacks in the afternoon and like barely any dinner and is totally, totally fine. Whereas like I think we have more of this mentality of like I need to eat my full mm-hmm. meals. And they're just way more in tune with that. And sometimes, like, well, all she eats is protein. All she eats is vegetables. All she eats is, like, one specific thing. And it's like, that's what her body needs right now. And I just, like, remind her, like, you know, you listen to your body. If you don't want to eat that, listen to your body. That's fine. Yeah. You don't have to eat that if you don't want it. I like that. I'm sure someday I will be calling yeah. you for advice. <laughs> I know. And I say <laughs> these things in, in everyday practice. It doesn't always go so well. Because when she's like, I want yogurt. And then I give her the yogurt. And she's like... I don't want that anymore. And she's like, I'm done. I'm just like, you know, the food waste part of me um, feels really upset. That's more triggering. And I'm like, that is going in the fridge and you will eat that later. And if you don't eat it, then your dad will eat it. Like someone <laughs> is eating that. <laughs> that is like half a cup of Greek yogurt. Someone is eating that. Yeah. Well, especially if I know for you, you grow so much of your family's food. It's a labor of love that wasting any of that is just not an option. Right. Yeah. And that doesn't, yeah, that's all fine. Yeah. Sometimes you have so much of it that you're like, I can compost a little bit. It's yeah. Okay. I've, I've, well, and I've, I've gotten a few veg- vegetable gifts from Jackie, which I very much Me appreciate. too. Yeah. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> that's good. All right. So Meg, I want to give you a chance to talk about this too, because I think your, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your pro- your journey into the nutrition has been different. It's come from mm. a different angle. You know, hers very like career driven, educationally driven. Yours, I know, like we said before, about finding a healthy routine for your mm-hmm. life. So tell me about how you first started thinking about making decisions on what to put in your mouth for, yeah. <laughs> for food. Yeah. <laughs> it all started when I got really, really sick. So in college. So let's flash back to kind of how I was raised was not a lot of prepackaged, quick convenience, not a lot of eating out. Um, My mom made, you know, most of our meals or we were provided with things in the house that we could make meals with. Okay. So that's kind of like where I was going into all the way up until college. And then I got into the dining hall. And then it was like, oh, I can have a bowl of cereal. I could have pizza with every meal. I could have soft serve after every meal. And it was just like, I was excited to have um, all these options. Yeah. People call it ingredient households I've seen. That. Yeah. And I, I, I experienced that too, where it's like, you don't just have like kind of snacks or whatever no, around no. growing up. Yeah. You yeah. have like stuff to make a meal. So I never had access to oh, like, no, those are my, those are my well, <laughs> you have goldfish. I have goldfish. <laughs> it's a really big box. Oh, there you go. So I kind of like, went for like a free for all. Like I was like Mm -hmm. very excited. And, uh, so I gained like 30 pounds my freshman year. Like I just went like after it, but I, over the course of the entire freshman year started to feel like I was getting these like stomach, like random stomach aches and like gastrointestinal issues where I just like feel nauseous or I would have to be by a bathroom. And it was like pretty infrequent. I would say my freshman year. And then sophomore year, um, I moved into my sorority house. So okay. not as much access to all the different options. I would go to the dining hall sometimes, but I would mostly be eating at the sorority. And we had options for like to make things. There was food that was 
made at our menu, but then we have like salad bar, like so you can make a salad or a sandwich. So like simple things too. Um, so still some more like choices that I wouldn't have had in my house that I was kind of still like more gravitating towards. Like we always had like mac and cheese in the sorority house, like frozen pizza. So I was like definitely like late night wanting those snacking things. things. Yeah, snacking yeah. things. And then over that year, my stomach aches became more frequent. So now it was kind of like, oh, randomly, like I would eat something and my stomach would hurt or like I would not feel that great. And then it was like, oh, like every time I'm eating, I'm not feeling well. Oh. And so I was kind of like, something's going on here. And then still progressing, eating the same way, not really listening to my body that much, except just being like, wow, this is like kind of annoying that like I'm just getting these stomach aches yeah. like this and like I just don't feel good. It sounds like you just didn't even know how to hear your body. No, like, I didn't. Alone like I was not, about it. not paying attention to that yeah. at all. Especially like we talked about going to like a party school, like you're going out, like you're drinking and... Oh yeah, pe- so you hop after, yeah. after drinking? I, I know so that much. you're asking yourself, what is me being hungover? What is my food? Like I really was just in a... And you're stressed out from your classes. So I just was like unwell in many ways. Well, and yeah. if, if that's the norm too, it just yeah. becomes normal. Oh, yeah. Like you don't necessarily make those connections or you don't even realize how sick you are. I didn't realize I was sick until I wasn't sick. Like looking back, yeah. it's kind of crazy to think, how did I not right. so years know you that? Spent, like so uncomfortable. Yeah. So junior year, it was like so bad. Now I was getting like, even when I wasn't eating, I was getting acid reflux and heartburn, which I'd never had before. So something's got to, something's got to be done about this. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's when I found out that I was allergic to pretty much all forms of dairy in some way, shape or form. I had at the time really bad eczema, like all over my body. How did you find that out? I got tested. Okay. So like an allergen, an allergen test. And it was big red flag. This is. So that is what took you to yes. just all of a sudden go, oh, shoot, I have to think about what's going in yes. my body. I yeah. never – seems so simple now. I never made the connection that it was what I was eating that was making me feel this way. Like, I didn't – I don't know why I didn't put that together. No, I can I can resonate with that. Yeah, like, you're just going about your life. Like, you have to eat. You were like, oh, I'm eating what I've been eating the last few years. Like, yeah, yeah, why yeah. does my stomach hurt? Because, like you said, Jackie, it – like, this is normal. Like, yeah. it's – everybody eats like this. Right. It must be me, not the food that's going into me. Yeah. So I get this test, and they from the moment they told me that, I cut out all forms of dairy that day. Like, okay. was like, I'm I'm so uncomfortable. You're done. I'm so bloated. I'm heartburn. I'm going to the bathroom all the time. Just like, I'm over this. So I cut it out, and that was in 2009. Yeah, 2009, and I have not had – Besides, like, three random incidences where it was given to me by accident, by not my choice, um, I have not had dairy since then. Okay. Um, and did you notice a change in your body immediately? Yeah, I lost, like, 14 pounds, I think, in the first two weeks. So, in, okay, so oh, in addition to not yeah. feeling like, like poo-poo and having acid reflux and stuff, you lost weight very yes, quickly. Yes, yes. Well, the initial inflammation. inflammation, yes. Like, my stomach was, like, hard and, like, distended like that's how like inflamed I was from what I from eating the dairy yeah so when I cut that out the first two weeks a lot of that inflammation uh started to, to go away my eczema started to go away I had not had eczema since then so we found out that was an autoimmune reaction um to dairy so so wait can I ask you a yeah. question just about that so w- going into cutting out dairy it sounds like it was really about feeling better mm-hmm do you think losing weight, like, did that kind of change your thinking about nutrition as well? Like, all of a sudden, losing that inflammation and looking smaller? Just because in college, I know that's yeah, yeah. such an ever-present feeling. I think I was so sick that that was, like, at – when I hit, like, the apex, like, before I cut dairy out, it was so consuming of, like, how unwell I felt. I really didn't – even think about the weight that I had gained at that point. Like it was, that was so secondary. Like I was just like, I'm wearing baggy clothes. I just feel awful. Like I just like feel like, so the weight, I couldn't even like concern myself with, with that. With the sudden weight loss. I was like, oh wow. Like I didn't realize what this, like what this was putting onto my body. It was just like such a slow, 
like I know I gained like the initial weight my freshman year, but from then on it was like a random pound here, random pound there. Like it wasn't this like dramatic, like within two months gaining all this weight. Like I kind of wasn't like paying attention to it yeah. too much yeah, because okay. I was just so concerned with my classes and the stress of that and hanging out with my friends and then not feeling well from this. Yeah. And then so when I cut that out, but I'm sure too, like looking back, there was like, you know, food affects you in so many ways, not just putting weight on or making your stomach upset, but like I had like brain fog with it too. Like I wasn't like my clarity wasn't there. So when I started cutting this out, it was like, oh, I could like make sense of things. More stuff. More stuff. So started losing the weight uh, over the course of the remainder of my junior year. So the middle of my junior year is when I found this out made the change. So I had the rest of my junior year of college and all of my senior year. So by the end of my senior year, I had lost all the weight I put on and, and more. Yeah. So I was like in a healthier, much healthier place with my body weight. Do you think though that the, that the weight loss from that change, the di- the dairy change, put your focus on your weight? Um, yes. After that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very much like almost like pushed me in the other direction of being like overly analytical of everything, everything. that I was putting into my body because yeah, I realized yeah. it, how much of an effect it had on me. Yeah. So I was like super careful and like that kind of sparked the, and as you both of you know, I rarely go out to eat. Um, yep. I just like, no, I still to this day, I've had too many instances of someone telling me there's not dairy in something or it's not cooked a certain way and that not being true. And I just rather have that ability to know that for myself. So that kind of started even then of like, I don't want to be put in that situation. Like I know I just, it was so recent of how I felt that way. And so in my memory that I was like, I don't want to go, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to go back to that. So I was very uh, aware of that. So that became... I didn't know anything about portion sizes. So I definitely, looking back, was very much under eating. But I was making better, I was making choices that were making my body feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I was eating nutritious food, but I had pulled back so much that I became not eating enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I wasn't really like too physically active. So I didn't really notice like, energetically that I was like tired from not eating enough. Like I just thought, yeah, like just whatever I'm sitting in class. Where were you getting your information about like what to eat? Uh, when I went and got tested. So at UNH, so the nutrition, I don't know if they were a registered dietitian there or nutritionist, Uh, but they kind of just gave me this like little pamphlet that was very similar to what we talk about with our clients now of like the, my, the, the, yeah, I can't even think, like, myplate.org or something it, like, yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, like, Not, uh, yeah, it does, like, shows, like, <laughs> the little, like, sections, like, mm-hmm. sectioned off things. So I just started thinking about, okay, like, when I eat a meal, how can I make it more balanced? Mm-hmm. Like, how am I having a little bit of all of these things at my different meals? Yeah, nice. Um, but, yeah, my meals were much smaller. So coming into CrossFit, I took my level one pretty soon. Um, so, like, the first kind of, like, step to becoming a coach, even before I became a coach, coming into CrossFit because I was just so interested in it. And there they talked about the zone diet and yeah. eating in different like blocks. Yeah, and I'm familiar with that. So you, like a very basic way of saying it is like you give a general description of yourself, like you're like female, your height, your current weight. And based on that, you have this many blocks of this, of fat, this many blocks of carbohydrates, this many blocks of protein. So instead of counting like your macros, there is like okay. math. So like, like each block is this many grams. Macros, right. for idiots And then you or have so many blocks per meal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That you like spread throughout the day. Okay. I did this thing. It's very similar. I just, I find it's like just an extra step. It is. Okay. Now looking back, it is an extra yeah. step, but it was, it yeah, yeah. allowed me to figure out, oh, I'm like having half the amount of protein that I should be having at my meals or well, at, certain people, the yeah. numbers of it all kind of are, can be overwhelming. Right. So, so just be like, you need three pieces of chicken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like that made it simpler to me. So right after a level one, Phil and I took it together, we started doing, p- practicing the zone diet just okay. to kind of like see what it was how'd like. It yeah. yeah. And see how it would go. So that was when I first got into like 
macros and thinking about like the amounts of things. Mm -hmm. And then flash forward to now, I very much enjoy meal prepping. Um, yeah. So, and at this point, I pretty much only measure my protein to make sure I'm getting enough. And I kind of eyeball everything else because I've just been doing it for so long yeah. um, that I have a general idea of of portions or what I what I feel my best eating at. Right. And you're cooking when you meal prep, like I know you are, like whole nutritious food. Yeah. So like a little extra fat, a little extra carbs, like it doesn't really matter because it's I'm not it's measuring on my oil before I'm putting it onto my vegetables. I kind of just like do a drizzle yeah. and I'm I'm good with that. And these I cook with, you know, avocado oil and or use olive oil and I'm not really I don't tell myself I need two tablespoons of peanut butter at some point today. Like I'm not like really over the top of like making sure I add in extra fats necessarily. Yeah. But kind of just listening, like what you tell Mar, listening to my body. And if I make something and I don't want to eat it and I haven't moved as much that day, I'll be like, I'll save that for another time. Or if I'm extra hungry and I've eaten all my meal prep meals, I will have a little bit more. Yeah. I'll have something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, at least it gives me like a nice general guideline of eating. And how you said earlier, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Like when you become an adult, (laughs) I was like, I don't want to have to decide this throughout the week. Like I find when I have to, when I'm tired, I've had a long day and I have to make those decisions on the spot, I'm less likely to make a decision that's going to feel good for myself. It's a more convenient decision. So if I can make the meals ahead of time, um, I don't have to worry about that. And I also really hate wasting food. So if I have already prepared food, I'm way less likely to eat something else because I don't want to waste the food that I've already bought and I've already made. Um, so it's like, it really just helps me in like so many, like so many ways. Meal prepping. Yeah. I mean, it works for me. Removing food decisions that like that you have to make in an instant definitely helps if you're trying, if your baseline to your point, Jackie, isn't just always pretty solid. Like for me, I, if I don't meal prep, the train comes off the tracks mm-hmm. pretty darn instantly. Cause I, you know, you go through a busy work day making decisions all day you get to the end of the day, it's like, I do not want to like make a decision about how to form a healthy plate right now. Yeah. Not only do I not want to, I don't even think I can effectively do that. Like I just don't have the energy. So it's like, Oh, we've got a frozen pizza in the fridge. Let's just do that. You know, I always have things like that, random things on hand, even when I'm meal prepping all the time, but I totally get that. So you both talked a little bit about, well, I'll say this. Jackie's talked a little bit about like how you're, like nutrition kind of like changes with seasons a little bit. Like when you're pregnant, like you think yeah. about things a little bit differently. I mean, and I eat very seasonally now just with having a garden. Um, and oh, then yeah, also yeah. like, cause in the summer we're doing like mostly like grilling and salads and, you know, just fresh stuff from the garden. Like there are certain things I like don't buy because I grow them in abundance. Like I haven't bought a tomato in like three or four years, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Weird flex, but okay. <laughs> I was like, that's so cool. Well, because I preserve it all. So, like, I make, like, lots of, like, sauces and stews and soups over the summer or over the winter from things that I yeah. grew in my garden. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like, I also, like, I will not buy green beans because I, like, grow them so much. So, like, we only eat them in the summer. Yeah. We do not. And Mara's like, ooh, look, green beans. I'm like, nope, not buying it. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. not buying it. Well, I just mean, like, as, some, as two people who – are really honed in on what you need to feel good energy. You, that isn't always the same, right? That doesn't stay the same your whole life. Like when you're pregnant, you need more energy or you might be more tired or you might need to cut certain things out because it doesn't feel good. Um, talk about what that is like to have to go from a routine that you know very well to having to shift what, you are, what you're eating. Do, is there any sort of just weirdness in your mind about that having to grapple with that no I mean I think for me it's just like being flexible um like I think I'm not so focused on it when I'm like right now I'm I have a nine-month-old baby so I'm still nursing and so like if I'm hungry I'm I'm eating for sure because I, I always need to make sure that I'm in that like good calorie surplus to you know be continuing to um breastfeed but there are definitely times where I feel more motivated to be more dialed in um like 
because coming off of the holidays where I was feeling like super low energy and I'm like, I can't do this. Like I've been working really hard um, since coming back from being pregnant and I want to make sure I have a good open performance and I need to have a really good long, like on ramp basically leading into the open. So like kind of just after I got all those yeah. carbs and cheese out of my fridge. I mean, granted, there are still plenty of carbs and cheese in my fridge, just in much lower quantities no. <laughs> that I'm consuming on a daily basis. Um, you know, I was making sure that I was, I was more dialed in and just making sure that I have like good sources of protein all the time and like doing more meal planning and meal prepping than I would normally do. And also I'm just having to evolve constantly because like as my kids get older, their needs um, are changing and their schedules are changing. And so like now my daughter who's four has like all these various afternoon activities. Like I never thought I'd be like have a busy schedule with, with a four-year-old, but we do. And so we're like not getting home until like five o'clock. And if I don't have dinner preps, like not only am I just like so hungry and ready to like have dinner, but I have a toddler screaming in my ear who's just so like done with the day and also very hungry. Yeah. So like I'm having to be just like a lot more organized too. And so that's been really helpful in like getting me uh, over the weekend to get some of that good meal prep in. And right. meal prep looks different for everybody. Like yesterday I just went in and I like, I chopped like every vegetable in my fridge. I prepped like whatever vegetables I'm going to be cooking for today, pulled stuff out of the freezer. That's going to be like for marinating or whatever. So I have like laid out just like a few meals. Some will be cooked ahead of time. Some are cooked day of depending on which day it is and how yeah. much time I have yeah stuff like that so yeah and just not being too married to whatever your your plan is because if you do have a family or if things come up you just don't want to be like totally totally sidetracked by um you know by those life. things yeah because yeah, it happens and the thing is like like oh it did meal prep didn't happen this weekend i guess i'll start over again next week it's like no you still have like a few days like you can make some good choices and also like or you try something and you just like really don't like it like you're just like I didn't like having to spend several hours on Sunday, like cooking food, like, okay, then maybe yeah. it's not for you. Maybe it wasn't for you this week. Maybe you need to try a different approach to it. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, there's not a right way to like consume healthy food. I do think that meal prep in general, or just at least planning it out, like knowing what you're going to eat, it does. I think that's how you make nutrition a priority because without doing some of that pre-thinking, it's, just unless you're someone yeah it's just a free-for-all or unless you're one of those people that's gonna go like well i ate a turkey sub at subway for six months like and be that guy who lost 100 pounds right, at subway, subway or whatever, or whatever. Just, right or just, you know, just skip meals or something, or something and it's just not yeah yeah that's not where you're going to be feeling your best and i'd love to talk about the challenge in the open yes we do need to talk about too. the challenge i know i'm sorry i didn't give Meg no, a I, I, to I, that. yeah because i i know that meg too you know even though I, 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 I know that you've also gone through seasons where it's like you're thinking about putting on lean mass mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. you know, we talked just the other day about how you have your foot injury that is making it hard or not possible to do more of the metabolic conditioning mm -hmm, that you're used to doing that would obviously impact what you can eat. So how do you, how have you shift through some of those changes and like kept in mind that you have like a whole life here that um. <laughs> I have a tendency, just me personally, to undereat mm -hmm. uh, things. So when I'm meal prepping or making food ahead of time, it, it helps me to make sure that I'm not getting too busy and I'm eating enough food. Okay. Um, so I, you and I had talked about this, like you said the other yeah. day, of, you know, with an injury, you don't need, when you're not expending as much energy, you don't necessarily need as much food. So in the beginning of my injury, I found myself trying to in small ways, like cut back some of my portioning. Yeah. Um, and it really just like didn't feel good to me. Like I felt like I feel so good on my routine and the calories that I was consuming. Yeah. Uh, that I felt like it would just be a better decision for me to continue to eat the same way and just mm -hmm. accept that I for this time may put on some extra weight and just be okay with with that, with that. and accepting yeah. that. Um and like mentally that just felt better to me so yeah. there you know there has been times where you know very similar to what you were saying you know coming off of a holiday season trying to get a little more back on track putting a lot of hard work in the gym wanting to see those results happen so like just making sure that I'm just focused on more like amounts of things during that 
But sometimes for me, it can go the other direction where I'm mm. focusing on it too much. So it, it feels better to me to just keep things the same if they're working yeah. for me. Uh, last thing I want to say, just kind of a point on meal prep in general. Yeah. Because I think it sometimes you said that comment of, and people, I often hear this, I don't want to spend so many hours. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, it's just so time consuming. And there is a lot of negative like if you were like meal prep and then you just like put all these like words to describe meal prep under and a lot of people would have negative words like yeah aso- yeah yeah like associated Time with consuming. it hard work well, yeah, yeah like lots just of dishes required. to clean up right yeah. like I don't want to do this um and I think the positives for it are hard for people to see because it is the a long game mm-hmm. of consistency of if I do this or you know I'll clients to say I did I meal prep this week why haven't I lost weight and it's like you need a meal prep for the next few months <laughs> and like consistency in some way you've got to you know like process yeah like just some continue. way of get, making yourself more consistent that's the goal of meal prep is like getting to a point where you're not skipping meals or making sure you're eating breakfast when you know that's a hard thing for you to do so maybe you're not even prepping the other meals but you're at least preparing some part of your breakfast so you get breakfast in. so making you more consistent so over the years Phil and I meal prep together and we've really used it as a way to come together. So like both really busy during the week, like it's a time to slow down. We listen to music. We tell stories about our week. We have like a fun time and just enjoy each other's company. So I think if people could find ways of making meal prep integrated into their life or like having Mara pick things out Mm -hmm. or having her prepare it with you, like it doesn't, you you can make it something positive for you that's not even related to food, but it will still get the same end result, still get you consistent. And it's providing something in the now, which I think is really important for people to eventually get to that big picture of months of consistency. Like it's providing quality time for us, a time to slow things down. We always say to ourselves like, we're so proud of ourselves. Like we still say that like every single time, like Like, look look at us, like doing something great for ourselves. Yeah. and but like <laughs> it's true <laughs> but like it's a way to give yourself some instant gratification that moves you forward instead of us both being like all right we got to get up early again spend yeah. hours in the kitchen it's like very much a perspective yeah. thing mm-hmm. so if you can find a way to flip that perspective of what meal prep means to you yeah uh i think people would be potential a little more successful yeah. with it. Yeah. I totally agree. I like, I have- Or gotten, try a new recipe. We talk about that all the right, time. Like excited to do that. Yeah, I, I actually, I really do like to cook. Like I really enjoy cooking. But like I said, having to cook after an eight, nine, sometimes 10 hour day of working, it's like, it doesn't feel fun. So meal prep for me is a time where I can just like, this is my cooking time, my creative time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I really go all in and do dedicate the hours, like I make many recipes, try, we just got a new cookbook and I I got the same cookbook for Meg for Christmas. It's great. But we're trying all these different recipes and I really enjoy doing that. Um, But the other point about it is I think you have to learn what's right for you. And we talked about this with Elliot a little bit on the other podcast, but I'm, I'm trying to get more open-minded to the fact, like, if I make something that, let's say, by day four in the week, it either does not look appetizing anymore. Like, I made a breakfast sheet pan, and now they all are, like, moist looking and weird. Okay, like, noted, next time I make that, I should only make three days worth and plan something else for later in the week that either holds up better or I can make on the fly easily Mm -hmm. you know and take it as a learning experience as opposed to getting to the end of the week and i've got all these soggy pancakes in the fridge and just feeling like i failed yeah so trying to take like i I heard a a a quote the other day that was like if you learned something it wasn't a failure Mm -hmm. you know and so that's that's how i'm trying to approach meal prep in this year like as i'm trying new recipes not getting on myself but it sounds like both of you are like I, th- I correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like both of you approach what you eat with a little bit m- more of an emphasis on the nutrition and the balance of it than necessarily what you're craving. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I definitely, I just kind of like naturally do that now. That's my default. Like, right, that's like I, I, yeah. I me there, too. There are gonna be vegetables. Like I think about those things. Um. 
But, you know, I also, like, love tacos. So I make tacos every week. Like, I make things that I like. Like, I'm not just, like, oh, here's this dried out piece of chicken with some some rice and steamed broccoli. Like, that's just, like, I don't want to eat that. But sometimes I do have meals where it's just, like, it's a bunch of roasted vegetables. It's, like, some meatballs. And it's some rice. And some that does happen. And I do enjoy that meal, too. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not, like, having to make super over-the-top things all the time that are, like, super, like, decadent or whatever. I just think when people think about meal prep, they, like, when I first started... Chicken, rice, and broccoli. Right. I was thinking about, like, the prep that somebody would do before, like, a body composition, you know, competition, you know, where they're, like, extremely lean and eating perfectly and eating strictly for fuel and no other parts. And I can't eat like that. Um, Kind of what you said about, like, the craving, though, too. Like, I think when you put an emphasis on eating a more balanced diet that you don't – your hunger and your feelings about food don't go in much – as much into extreme areas. Like, if you, like, find yourself really craving, like, something fried, it's like, am I having enough fat in my diet? Like, like your body is usually trying to tell you something through those cravings. Or, like, am I not getting enough sleep? Am I not drinking enough water? Like, those are often, like, it's like um, the, like, lights that come on in your car, Mm -hmm. right? That, like, you're out of oil and stuff. So the more you're consistent and you're eating balanced, yeah, you still get, like, well, I'll see something in the store. I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. Like, I really like that. Like, let's, maybe we'll make that tonight. And that's why I don't prep for food on the weekends. We reserve that for those exact things. Like we haven't had that in a while or like that doesn't keep well if we prep that food ahead of time. So it leaves the the time in our schedule and our routine for some more variation, which I also think helps keeps us, keep us more on track during the week too. So what I'm hearing is both of you have, what you said in the very beginning is just a, a pretty in tune baseline. And that helps you make these decisions about when you know, the season of your life or the literal season of the year is changing and you want to cook differently or you have different goals or you get an injury or you get pregnant and things need to change because that baseline of how to fuel yourself is in check. It it sounds like there's less mental games going on Mm -hmm. to be able to shift around. Right. So with that said, the, I think that's a great segue to talk about the nutrition challenge Mm -hmm. because from what I've been told about the nutrition challenge thus far, which I haven't told Jackie I'm going to do, but you can consider this my official uh, entry into the nutrition challenge. Um, what I've heard so far is that it's it's going to be about improving that baseline in how you fuel your fitness and help us go into the open. Yeah. So, Well, I think any nutrition challenge is going to be trying to raise what your baseline is, in, increase the number of vegetables you're eating, paying attention to how much protein you're getting putting the emphasis on getting enough sleep, all those things are still going to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But the main theme of this challenge, since we're doing it as as an accompaniment to the the CrossFit Open, is fueling for performance. So really shining a light on what am I eating before, possibly during, and after exercise, and how does that influence me? And we're specifically talking about exercise as doing a CrossFit class. Um, and so it's not just how should I be eating before and after the open workout. It's going to be how should I be eating before and after every single class. Um, and do I perform better when I eat in this way? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to tell you right now that if you join the challenge and follow along with my recommendations for how to eat around exercise, um, you will, in fact, perform better. Are we good? Are we good? good. Yes, you will perform better. You will perform better. Uh, And so one of the parts that's going to be a part of the challenge is formulating a personalized performance plan. And so what that will entail is like we just have like if if you've done a challenge before, you know, during the first week of the challenge, um, I set up just like 10 minute virtual meetings with everybody just to get that touch point. And in that brief meeting, we will come up with what your personalized like nutrition plan is going to be for around workouts because I know some people are those like 5 30 a.m people some people coming in after work at five o'clock mm-hmm. um so it's going to be a little bit different for everybody just depending on what it's going to be and so we can just figure out what that plan is going to be for you are you eating enough carbohydrates are you eating enough protein um, and we put a lot of emphasis on protein um but really actually 
Um, the game changer here is going to actually be the carbohydrates. So, and we will figure out what that means for you if you do the nutrition challenge. And I think the open is a really fun time to kind of do this because I think people get really excited about it. Um, and you just want to perform at your best. Um, I don't know if any of us this year are going to be going to the games. Um, but we want to feel like we're putting our best foot forward. Um, I think I could without a pull up. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be the first, probably. I'd be the first. <laughs> um, and so I, I just want to, I think that we all want to be feeling at our best and, and know that we're, we're doing what we can to, to have our best performance and start. And for some people, maybe you really haven't thought about what you're eating before and after class, and that's totally fine. Um, but we put in this hour of work. We work really, really hard. And I want everyone to be getting the most benefit out of these workouts. And so your recovery nutrition and your nutrition going into a workout are going to dramatically mm. improve if you're paying attention. Or your performance will dramatically improve if you're paying attention to those things. Sometimes it's right away. And then there's also long-term gain of like having better lean mass gain because you're prioritizing that recovery nutrition yeah all of that all those things yeah. yeah i mean i can say with absolute certainty that especially in a competitive endeavor but even just day to day like when you are giving it your all it feels so much better like the competition that i did last january i did great and i maybe even if i hadn't have dialed in on like all the nutrition and like thinking about like the snacks that i was going to have throughout the competition and making sure to eat before workouts in the weeks leading up to it, like just honing that in. I still would probably have done great because those workouts were in my wheelhouse in that competition that I did. But I felt so good about that win, not because I won, but because I did everything that I said that I was mm -hmm. going to do for myself and especially around the nutrition and, and fueling for the workouts. So yeah, that is very true. And I'm looking very forward to this challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I think it'll be fun. And I hope it helps people just feel a little bit more prepared in how to, you know, approach any CrossFit class, but as well, just the intensity that an open workout can be. Yeah. So, I mean, even if you're going into the open with like, you've even never, never done the open and you're like, what are these crazy people talking about with the open? Or you've gone through the open and it's always just been like, well, I'm here anyway, so I might as well do the workouts and put them on the board or whatever. I think joining the challenge could just make the open that much more exciting because mm -hmm. it's housing a a bigger goal for you yeah, you know gives it a new meaning yeah exactly exactly okay anything else either of you would like to get off your chest about nutrition <laughs> okay i would like us to do that's why i was looking i wanted to check the time of how much time we oh have. my gosh what we're gonna do one random question okay. this is my fear this is it this is it it's coming true <laughs> we're okay con we're conquering mike's fears okay let's just see i'm gonna take one from the middle of the stack say no pass <laughs> <laughs> okay this one this one's silly uh, let's just see take it everyone okay is it wrong to stand up and leave a boring lecture No. <laughs> well, we, we don't. Just, just, well, it's am I in college Jack, or am I? Jack is too busy partying to be at the lecture, lecture. Apparently, yeah. Is this like a now thing, like a voluntary, like you paid to be somewhere? Right, like, like life is too short. They have know, so, a presentation, and like I'm like, no, I can go do something else. Like, yeah, I can leave. It's fine. Uh, is some it, of these are some of these are thick. Would you change your religion to be able to marry the person you love? I, I'm not a very religious person, no, so yeah, that's an easy an question atheist. for me. But would you, would you become religious for someone? Oh, that's very like interesting. If all of a sudden Phil was like, it's super important for me, for you to be Jewish. I don't think I could. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a reality. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I could. Yeah, I don't think so. I feel like that's like, well, I, I think guess it would I feel really like the first, it would probably depend on what the religion was. Yeah. But for me, like religion is, is not an important part of my life and nor is it my husband so i think it's one yeah. of those things that hopefully you're on the same page from the beginning yeah. because it's one yeah. of those things that most people don't want to change and i have no intention of changing. 
Yeah. Well, I think it's one of those things, like, if you are going to change that, like, it's probably more so to satisfy that person's parents because yeah. if they were really, like... I was just going to say... If religion is super important to you, then you're probably looking for somebody that that is also important to them. Like, the f people I have in my life mm -hmm. that religion, um, and it, particularly Christianity, is, like, a driving force in their life and they wouldn't marry somebody unless they were mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. of the same belief system. Like, meeting someone and helping them to convert, that could be a beautiful love story, but, like, if it's a... You have to do this mm -hmm. to get married. It's probably right. It was probably, probably a no from the beginning. Parents yeah. who want that to be happening. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say. I feel like I'd want a partner who would accept that. Like I am, like that is me, and like we've gotten to a point in a relationship where like that is okay to to do what you would like to do, and yeah. it's okay to do what I would like to do. That's not. Yeah. So, but yeah, that yeah, would have to be. Yeah, you would know that from like very early on. I feel like in a relationship or. Yeah. Okay, this question, do you ever cheat when playing games? I'm just going to assume no because you guys are athletes and you, you do No, I'm so no. competitive. Yeah. I'd be I so know, guys... mad if I found out that someone cheated while okay, I was playing when's... a game or even, like, let me win. Oh, like... When's the last time you shaved a rep in a workout? Never. Never. <laughs> I don't. Like, that is, like, if flat anything, out. If I'm not sh – it's only – if I'm not sure if I I'll do an extra rep. rep. I'll do, I'll an do extra more. Rep. I'm like, was that 30 or 31? Yeah, I'm gonna do one more. 30. Yeah, we were we were working we were working out the other day and I Billy don't. go we were supposed to do like twelve box jumps or twelve something. And he goes, Ah, oh, I've been doing ten and we're like three rounds in. I was like, We'll do fourteen next time and he's like, Okay. <laughs> Get all the reps in. Okay, see that wasn't that scary. That wasn't that bad, no. <laughs> all right, so before we close, Meg, how was it? How'd it go? After the first few minutes, it was okay. Once I got, like, stopped shaking and sweating. <laughs> it's yeah. all good. You did great. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for listening to the Dauntless Podcast, episode 13, not 18. <laughs> Getting a little ahead of myself. And thank you for coming on and talking to me. I Absolutely. hope you'll come back. Yes. Anytime. Okay. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next going to have a think about it. Yeah. All right. We're done. <laughs>